Hi, everybody. This is kind of weird to not be uh, in front of everybody. I'm used to giving talks in front of everybody. So I hope that you'll take advantage of the questions and ask me any questions because normally I would ask you to ask me questions during this. I also want to apologize in advance. I'm not crying, really. It's just that the wind and <clears throat> peak allergy season have kind of done a number to my sinuses and my eyes. So if I look like I'm crying, I'm not really. I'm very actually very happy to be here. I love Nevadans for Cultural Preservation and I'm happy to support them in any way I can. So uh, today I'm going to actually talk about some research that we've been doing for, I was surprised to see since 2008. I didn't realize it had been that long uh, in what's called the Mojave Sink. And I have a map of that in a little bit. And so what I'm going to do is, is kind of bring all of what we've been doing so far together and discuss what we think is going on. And then uh, hopefully we'll have some directions that we can uh, move in as we go in the future. So I'm going to talk about land use in the Mojave Sink and hunt these hunting blinds that we just recently found and then how we think that relates to technological and climate change even uh, in this area. So with that, I will get started. For those of you who've ever driven to LA, you have driven through the Mojave Sink, or at least the portion of the Mojave Sink that I'm going to talk about, because it's uh, right uh, outside Baker near what's called Zizix. Uh, some of you have seen it as you've driven by. And I'm going to talk specifically about, so it's right in this area, it's what we call the central Mojave Desert. And the big thing there, of course, is the Mojave River which is, was critical, as we will we'll discuss, to the lives of these folks. But uh, if you've driven through that area, you know that, that it's a very arid desert. It is not, and it, nobody would call it a lush, beautiful area. But to prehistoric hunter-gatherers, there was actually, during certain periods of time, uh, things that they could really use and really like to use. And so, uh, it began as, and I'm not going to talk about this period because we haven't really looked at that period in our research, but it began as Pleistocene Lake Mojave. So during the Pleistocene, there was a large lake there. We do have a lot of early sites along the lake shores. Uh, and then as, as the climate changed about 8,000 years ago, between seven and 8,000 years ago, the Pleistocene Mojave began to shrink and we get two lakes. Uh, one is called Silver Lake. So here's Baker, here's the highway. If you're driving through, you're driving right through the middle of this. Uh, here's Silver Lake and here's Soda Playa. And I'm gonna talk about Soda Playa mostly. Uh, Claude Warren has done, who was also at UNLV for many, many years, has done a lot of research along Silver Lake looking at uh, especially the, the Pleistocene and early Holocene occupations of that area. But I'm going to talk about this area, and this is Soda Playa, and then on into Afton Canyon. So we're going to kind of stay in this portion of the Mojave Sink. Uh, as you can see, as I said, it's not lush. But there are resources that are available that hunter priest or hunter gatherers could have used. And it's obviously extremely seasonal. And it's also very dependent on the climate. What it, is it wet, a wet period? Is it a dry period? Uh, when soda playa would fill up, you could see, see the, the salt there, it wouldn't have been potable water per se. But thankfully for these hunter-gatherers, there were springs all along the edge. And so those springs were really the key. Uh, Afton Canyon, you have the Mojave River cutting through it. So water was always critical in any desert environment. And that's the truth for here, here. Truth for this area as well. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about three particular sites or areas 
uh, that we have kind of used to piece together how land was being used during this time period. And so I'm gonna kind of take us through uh, this whole Southern portion using these sites as examples. And so the first one I wanna talk about is a site called the Mojave Delta site. And this is right here. Uh, if, if you've ever been to this region, the um, highway would be way up, up over here somewhere. Uh, this is the Desert Research Institute run by Cal State Fullerton. Uh, they do a lot of class or did pre-COVID. <laughs> they did a lot of classes out there. Did, they did a lot of, of uh, desert research. And so hopefully again, very soon. And so we were able to go out and you, when we were doing these projects, able to use their facilities, which was just wonderful. They have a uh, uh, kind of dorm rooms and a central area with a kitchen. And so it's, it's really great when you're doing these kinds of projects to be able to go do that. So the site I'm going to talk to you about right now was on uh, dunes um, on the south. So on the, the, the portion of the lake shore uh, that is just to the south of the mountains here. So we're going out from the mountains into the dune area. And here's just a picture to kind of show you that. So this, these, these are the, uh, this is the site that I'm talking about. It's in these dunes. And we went out there really to look at what was going on out there. Uh, one of my students, former students, Tiffany Arendt, who's now working for the BLM, had done a survey and found these various sites. And so we were really interested in trying to figure out what was going on with these groups. What were they doing out here? And it, basically, and so we wanted to look at their subsistence practices uh, of late prehistoric groups. So AD 1200 and beyond. So they're still hunter gatherers, but, but they're using ceramics and they're moving around the landscape. And so we wanted to kind of see what were they doing as they moved around this landscape. And then what we were, our ultimate goal, and this is what I'm gonna talk about tonight, our ultimate goal was looking at how this land use fit into the whole Mojave Sink region and, and what we could say about how groups were using this area. So. That's how we kind of framed our work at the Mojave Delta site. Uh, it's, a, as I say, a late prehistoric, so post AD 1200 occupation, uh, indicated by the ceramics we, we recovered from the surface on the site when we were first out there trying to figure out what was going on, and then from the excavation units. Might have been occupied later, uh, but we have kind of iffy day. It's, it's, we don't have strong data to support that at this point. Other areas over by the desert research, um, I'm gonna go back here just a second. Over here, there are numerous sites that were occupied post AD 1400. So it's probably likely that they were at least using this seasonally during that time. But we, our bulk of our excavation data came back in this period. Uh, this, I had fortunately started my career working in Wyoming at dune sites, so I knew what dune sites were like. Uh, dune sites are not easy to dig. I, I just want to tell you that this is one of our field school students. Don't give her a hard time about not keeping her wall straight. <laughs> it was impossible to keep the walls straight during this time. Uh, we did everything we could to shore them up and, and keep everybody safe. But dune sites are active. And you're going to see that when I show pictures in a minute. And that's one of the issues we faced as we were doing this research is that everything was just so jumbled. And the artifact, so we, when we analyzed everything, we had to analyze it as a conglomerate because we couldn't find these nice stratigraphic layers that you sometimes are able to find at archeological sites. And you can see some of the artifacts here. And literally we were out there, we did, this was done as a weekend field school. 
So we were out there and, and from one weekend to the next, sometimes whole areas would be covered and uh, would be exposed. So active dunes are really uh, interesting to work in. Uh, and that's why <laughs> I set that up because if, if I then, if I first showed you pictures of these features, you'd be like, what in the world is she talking about? But these are actually features. And they get, they're, they're clusters of firecrack rock, which probably, well, were uh, prehistoric harves. And they've just been reworked by the dunes. So we would find these clusters of firecrack rock and ground stone used to process plants and occasionally some flecks of charcoal. This is one of, sadly, one of the most intact features we found. We actually found portions of the hearth in there. Uh, but this area had really been, again, reworked by the dune, dune movement and the wind. But we found a lot of these features and they were all over this dune field, but they were also, at least from when we started recording it, very specialized. They, it didn't look like these were campsites where family groups were coming, which is what we had if you went to the west of where we were. Uh, there were big campsites with lots and lots of material and this site was, we thought that that might be what it was based on what we had seen on the surface. But as we started doing our excavations, we found out that it was really, really specialized use. And with, so with these features, with these clusters of firecrack rocks that, that represent uh, uh, hearths and, and features that were used to, to cook things, we also found a ton of ground stone. And this ground stone was used, these are the matates, the base stones that were used for grinding plants. And they were systematic, they were very abundant, but they were systematically not very heavily used. You can't really tell this as well in, the, in these uh, photos, but they, were, they weren't coming back and using these and using these and using these. So you get really heavy wear. They were actually pretty lightly worn. But the cool thing about this is two of the biggest ones were turned upside down. And we, we, we checked the geomorphology. It doesn't look like they were turned upside down because of the dune movement. Instead, it really looks like they were turned upside down and left there because people were coming back on a regular basis. And they didn't want the matati to sit up on there and get walked over and peed on by animals. And so <laughs> they decided we'll just turn it over. And when we come back, we'll get it, we'll use it again. So that was one of the ways we were able to determine that this site was repeatedly reused. So Barb, we have a, a relevant question to this slide. Um, Kara asks, are the edges of those matates flaked from shaping? You know, uh, a, a couple of them are. And so not all, like certainly this isn't. So that's a great question. Yes, a couple of them, I think three, maybe three, I'd have to look at the data again, but I think three of them were shaped. And again, just to get them down to, they're, they're not that big and I don't have a scale in here, uh, but uh, yes, the answer is yes. And that makes it really interesting because they're not heavily used. And usually when you go to the, to the effort of shaping them, you're then gonna use them and use them and use them. Uh, but for some reason, these don't exhibit that kind of heavy use, so. So the results of that field work at the Mojave Delta site uh, indicate that this was a seasonally used plant procurement site. We had Dave Rohde at the Desert Research Institute look at the, the uh, we found very little charcoal in these, these hearths because it was all spread out, uh, but he looked at them and he couldn't identify any, discreetly any plants. But if you look at the distribution of plants there, there are spring annuals all over, annual plants that come available in the spring, all over that whole area. And here's a picture of one. 
of some. And so we think that they were probably focusing on these spring annuals, which suggests that they were coming very specialized, coming in in the spring, processing these plants, and then either going back to their campsites, uh, which were located in other areas, or uh, moving on and doing other stuff. They used some desert tortoise. We have a little bit of evidence of use of desert tortoise, uh, but no bighorn sheep. And that's, remember that because I'm gonna come back to that because uh, it, it is important and it really supports the idea that this was a very specific seasonally used site. Um, and then the evidence that we found from the, the ceramics and the temporal data is that it was used probably repeatedly. They were just coming back and coming back and coming back throughout the late prehistoric period. So throughout that, that whole AD 1200 to 1400 range. And so our excavation results, and again, remember this because we're gonna come back to it, is that it was a specialized plant gathering site with evidence of seasonal use, much like what we see uh, with ethnographic Paiute groups, Chemawevi and Paiute groups in this area. So then we, we, and, and we had already done this work at Soda Playa, so we're starting to build a, a an idea of what's going on here. And so remember Mojave Delta was over here and now we're gonna move up closer to their Desert Research Center. In fact, if you ever go to the Desert Research Center, you can just walk out along the playa and you'll see this. Uh, we did some work at so what's called Soda Springs Rock Shelter. And Soda Springs Rock, Rock Shelter is literally right on the shore of Soda Playa directly on the shore. I'm actually standing on the shoreline to take this picture. Uh, and the rock shelter was originally excavated in the 1980s by archeologists from Cal State Fullerton. Uh, the D. Schroff did the analysis there. They did a little bit of work in the shelter and a little tiny bit of work outside the shelter uh, it was never written up. D wrote a, a short article on it. It turns out, uh, and I, I actually went to Cal State Fullerton and looked at their, their collections, and it turns out that the reason there was never anything written up is both of the archaeologists who ran this excavation were killed tragically in a plane crash. And uh, so D was, D was called in to kind of bring things together, uh, but... Um, it was, ne there's no formal report on it. And, but what she argued was that it was a specialized hunting camp. And it was based on the fact that they found uh, lots and lots of, of animal bone and a sequence, they found a sequence of hearths uh, or, or cooking areas. And then they found a, a lot of projectile points. Uh, we did some additional excavations in midden deposits outside the rock shelter. And so you can see everybody working on that there. Uh, we didn't find a ton of stuff, but what we did find completely supported what Dee had said. And that is that we found uh, mostly projectile points and bifaces. We found uh, arrow points primarily. So but we did find, uh, uh, we found arrow points, but the previous work by Dee and, and her colleagues had found a few middle archaic points and then some other dark points. So, so it looked like the whole rock shelter was used going back possibly as early as three to 5,000 BC and up into the late prehistoric period. So continued use for hunting. Uh, we only found four pieces of ceramics and we found no ground stone. D found one piece. So these guys completely different than what we had at Mojave Delta site. These guys were not processing plants. They were hunting. But more significantly to us was that there wasn't any change over time. They didn't change their strategy. They didn't, they just were hunting. They were hunting bighorn. They were hunting uh, smaller game as well, but they just continued to do that kind of hunting. And, and again, keep that in mind because 
what I'm going to talk about next suggests that there were some different things going on in this region. So Soda Springs, our excavation results, specialized hunting camp. So we've got a specialized gathering camp, we've got a specialized hunting camp. And this, just to show you that this was actually a photo I took while we were at working in the area. So there are still abundant uh, bighorn sheep today. There's actually, this is on the road that goes through that area. There's bighorn sheep crossing. So uh, we know that there are abundant sheep in that area. Okay, so we also knew from, from Tiffany Arend, uh, from her survey, that there were big campsites there. And we kept finding these specialized uh, youth sites. And so we're like, well, wait a minute, what's going on? And so we started looking at uh, some climatic data that, that geoarchaeologists and geologists had pulled together. And what we found out was that there were wet periods during the Holocene. So during the time that this, uh, um, late, these late prehistoric sites were occupied, there were periods where it was really wet uh, for the area. Again, not, not wet if you're from Oregon, but wet, <laughs> wet if you're from the Mojave Desert. Uh, and this would have resulted in increased flow in the river, there's a picture of it with increased flow. Uh, the springs would have recharged, so the springs would have been flowing, so you got lots of fresh water available. There were standing lakes in the Cronies Basin, which is, uh, is near the Mojave, uh, the, this area that we're, the Soda Playa area, uh, just to the west of this area. And then you would have had periodic standing water in both Soda Playa and Silver Lake. So you would have had a, a, a kind of resurgence of plant and animal life in this area. And so we think that this really conditioned how prehistoric hunter gatherers were using this area. And so what we think happened is that during wet periods, wet seasons when, when their springs were recharged and there was some a little bit of standing water, that that's when those camps were occupied. Those big campsites on the dunes that, that Tiffany recorded, that those were occupied during periods when that ho the whole region was really, you could occupy it easily. And then the other sites that we found, Soda Playa and Mojave Delta, those were actually much more specialized use during dry seasons. So either dry seasons or periods of drought. And what would happen is these prehistoric hunter gatherers would move to not, they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're really good resource managers there. They would move to the river. The river always had water in it. So they would move to well water areas along the river. And we have evidence of occupations along the river throughout this whole period. And then what they would do is they would come into this area for short term seasonal occupation. And we think that it was very gender specific that those gathering camps were probably women, probably small groups of women coming in, getting the plants, processing them, going back to the to the big camps, the family camps. Uh, these Soda Springs Rock Shelter, it's only used for hunting. Men coming in, hunting, going back. So we have this kind of pattern of seasonal use that we were we were looking at. And right about that time as we were developing this model, uh, Joan Schneider, who had, had excavated in Afton Canyon said, well, Barb, you're really getting, use, you're getting interested in looking at specialized land use. She goes, she excavated a site along Afton Canyon and she said, above the, the river site, there are these hills. And she goes, I think there are some specialized features up there. You should go up and take a look. So, 
this is the, her site where she, so this is Afton Canyon. This is where the river goes through it. The Mojave River goes through it. And then there are these hills up around it. And so she dug, this is the Afton Canyon site that she excavated. It's the only excavated site in that area, in the Afton Canyon area. And she excavated uh, it and, and wrote a report on it in 1989 and found that it was used because it's a riverine site, it's a nice site, right? Along the river, ready water, that it was used episodically. Again, the, all these sites are seasonal, just some of them are occupied by larger groups, some of family groups, some of them are off, occupied by very specialized groups. But this was a campsite that was episodically used from late archaic through the later prehistoric. So that kind of same long-term use that we see at Soda Playa. And that it was used for getting lithic materials. So raw materials for making stone tools and then also for hunting bighorn sheep. So they were at this site along the river for multiple reasons. And so she said, when she, she talked, she goes, Barb, you should go up on the ridges and see what's going on up there. And so we did. So I don't know if you can see, hopefully you can see <laughs> that we actually did. We climbed up on those ridges and we did a, a bunch of survey in this area, thanks to Jim Shear, uh, who from the BLM, who uh, gave us access and permission to do so. And we started recording these sites. The majority of them were lithic scatters. Uh, we found a total in, in the multiple years that we did these surveys, we found 29 sites, 25 isolated finds. Uh, we found some along the river. We did a little bit of survey along the river. Uh, and then of course we found a bunch of sites up on these uh, ridges above and overlooking Afton Canyon, the canyon itself. The majority of these were lithic scatters, so just stone, uh, either stone tools and some debitage. Uh, so uh, not a lot of information on them. But then we identified what we are interpreting as uh, hunting blocks. And these hunting blinds, I'm gonna show you photos in just a minute, are found on these ridges overlooking the canyon. We found 11 of them uh, on the Southern Plateau, the South, and I'll show you a picture in just a minute. And then we found five, we, we called them cleared circles because they didn't have stacked rock. If they had stacked rock, we would, we would feel confident they were hunting blinds. We found five cleared circles we're not really sure if they were hunting blinds or they were some other kind of feature. So we, we didn't include them in our designation as hunting blinds. Uh, but they, my guess would be that they probably were. So um, here's a, a map of the sites that we found along the river. Uh, as I say, the majority of them, the hunting blinds are down along here few along here, and then just tons of lithic scatters all over the place. Uh, these had, these were down closer to the river. These had both uh, lithic scatters and ground stone on them. So again, probably more akin to what Joan found at Afton Canyon. But I want to talk about these specialized sites because they were involved some labor. And so when we looked at them, I was thinking, how in the world do the, what are these guys doing? This isn't so to apply, the river's there, but these guys are putting some labor investment into building these hunting blinds. And this is very specialized kind of land use that you wouldn't normally expect in a, an environment like this. Prehistoric hunter-gatherers, we know from ethnographic hunter-gatherers and from, from what we've done through studies of other hunter-gatherers, is that they were, they don't like risk. They're very conservative and they don't like risk. And so you're in this incredibly risky environment and you're spending time building a hunting blind? 
Well, when we, as we documented this survey data, we began to think about who would do this and why. And we began to really look at the distribution of these. And I began to do some ethnographic work. And the, the ethno, ethnographic accounts, there are actually quite a few of these. I just found one because it's, I just put one on here because it's just so clear. I found nest-like enclosures built of stone in which I afterward learned one or more Indians would lie in wait while their companions scoured the ridges below, knowing the alarmed sheep would surely run to the summit. And this was 1901, and Muir was, was describing the use of these hunting blinds, here's one of the ones we recorded, to buy Native Americans, buy Paiutes at that time, to get bighorn sheep. And so we began to look at these and think, okay, what in the world, why would you do this? Why wouldn't you just hunt the bighorn sheep at Soda Playa or along the river? Why would you build these specialized features? And here are just, these were bighorn sheep photographed near the project areas. So we know that there were bighorn sheep there. And so that's where the technological change component of this comes in. You wouldn't do this if you were still hunting with darts because it would be too risky. But once the bow and arrow comes in, and, and this is well-documented ethnographically because by the time ethnographic groups were, were, uh, were um, documented, by the times they, they were doing that, they were using the bow and arrow. So they weren't using darts, but the bow and arrow would enable you to just do that. You could wait, if you were a good hunter and, and good with it, you could wait. And if the sheep were down at the river and they were happily drinking the water and then they were moving along, the sheep, if you had others, uh, either yelling or doing something to scare the sheep. What do the sheep do? We know this from even modern hunters. Sheep tend to run up, okay? And so if they run up and you've got them running up and you've got a hunter there with a bow and arrow, got one. And so that, and, and that it also explains that at many of the sites we find evidence that they're taking, uh, not, in, not in this area, but along, uh, Moh the Mojave Desert, that they're taking the bigger animals, the, the male. They're not taking the, the mothers and the babies. They're taking the big males. Well, that way you could choose. If you're sitting there with your bow and arrow waiting, you can choose. So we think that these uh, specialized sites are directly tied to the introduction of the bow and arrow. Um, the problem <laughs> with our survey is that we found so few projectile point points. We found a really, really early, um, uh, probably uh, terminal Pleistocene point. And then we found a couple arrow points. But that area today, some of you have probably been there, very heavily hiked. And so we think a lot of the points have probably been picked up through time. And that's why we found so few points because even if they were taking away usable points, usually if a point broke, you would just discard it there. But we just didn't, we found very, very few points, which was kind of a big surprise. Uh, the other thing that we found, and this is very typical of, it's human nature also. If you're the hunter and you're sitting in that hunting blind, you're gonna get a little bored after a while. And so lo and behold, there's lots and lots of raw material for stone tool production all over after the African Kenya area. We found a bunch of sites where they were going in and, and testing the material and taking the raw material. So this was an area that was used for, to get tool stone also. It wasn't just used for hunting, it was also used for tool stone. But the, the interesting thing is that a lot of those hunting blinds have evidence of, of napping in there, that they're flint napping in there. And I think it was just because it, it helped them while away the time while they were waiting 
the, for the sheep to come, might as well do something. So we find abundant evidence in those hunting blinds of them uh, doing some lithic uh, production too. So our results from Afton Canyon came back a little bit different than what we see as going on uh, in the main part of Soda Playa. And that first of all, I think that the major influence of the occupation of this area, it's why we don't see a lot of, early, we don't see hardly any early occupation. We don't, we found one in that whole survey area, we found one possible archaic point, but probably not uh, even, I mean, it, and it was an early one. So they were not using this during the archaic period because it was probably not a great place to be unless you were right by the river, which is where Joan found evidence of them using it through from the archaic through the late prehistoric, but away from the river, once you got away from that river, they weren't there until the bow and arrow comes in. And once the bow and arrow comes in and they can hunt using that strategy, then they were able to, to justify being out there and spending the time and the labor to make these features. And what's really interesting to me is that they shift then, if you look at Soda Playa, Soda Playa, Soda, Soda Springs Rock Shelter looks nothing like this. Soda Springs Rock Shelter, you have from 5000 BC to AD 1400, no change. They're hunting bighorn sheep there. And so I think they were there doing encounter hunting. The sheep would come by, the spring had water in it, the sheep would come by, encounter it, <laughs> they would encounter it, they would kill it, they would eat it. This is a very different strategy. This is a very targeted ambush. We're gonna ambush the sheep and the introduction of this new technology allowed them to do it and made it possible for them to occupy an area like this that you normally wouldn't expect uh, hunter-gatherers to build, to, to invest labor, even though you know it's, it wasn't like they weren't uh, mortaring the stove, but they still had to put some labor into making these features and maintaining these features. So I'll leave you with the idea that, that I've learned from all of these projects, and that is that uh, we have a lot to learn about these groups because they will, if Joan hadn't told us to go up on that, uh, on those ledges, we would not have known that they had expanded what they were doing and how they were doing it. And so, uh, again, it's why we love archaeology. It excites us. And there always seems to be a new, uh, new something over the horizon, so to speak. So... Uh, thank you for listening, and, and uh, I will welcome questions. I hope you have some, and thanks to all of these people who have made all of these projects uh, possible, and I will, again, be happy to answer questions if you have them. All right, Barb. Um, so I'm going to just read out the questions. That way everybody who's here can um, hear the question themselves. Um, Erica says, yes, boredom leads to napping. And I gotta say, I, that does happen to me too. Um, but having looked at some Northern Nevada petroglyphs, I wonder if age of artists can be determined by art content. I also wonder because I spend very much time at a site with very many napping rejects, um, if you would speculate on who was lying in wait, who was driving animals up the hill, who held the weapons, and in other words, who garnered accolades. Well, that's a great question. And, and again, this is all big, because all we have are the stacked rocks and some napping material. But based on ethnographic data, it was the best hunters. You wouldn't put a novice hunter up there. Uh, it, because, because once those sheep come up there, you need somebody that you know is going to be able to shoot that arrow and kill the sheep. And I'm not an archer, but I've known archers and it's not as easy as it look. You know, they make it look easy. Oh, look, I, I hit the, the bullseye. But apparently, and I, I don't know if any of you are 
archers, but it's not that easy. And so I, I think I can confidently say that <clears throat> the, the best hunters were lying in wait. Uh, now, who was, do, who was helping get the sheep to, to go run up? That's a good question. Was it the family groups that were camping? Was it specialized hunting parties? Which in ethnographically, that's what it was. Uh, and, but it's, it's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell who was doing that. But I guarantee you the best hunter was the one lying in wait. All right, um, and Kara asks, do you see similarities between the game drive hunting blinds to the north in the Great Basin versus these hunting blinds? Is there any evidence of linear features to help guide the sheep? No, and that's really interesting because that's one of the things that, that they see, it seems to be a little bit different strategy. They also have a whole series of hunting blinds in uh, Anza Borrego. So th this is not unique to Afton Canyon. That, thank you for bringing that up because it's not. There are a bunch of them up north. There are a bunch of them in Anza Borrego. And so this seems to be a really common strategy, again, I think after the bow and arrow comes in. But up north, they like take it to the nth degree. And that's why I think that this was, it, it was a smaller scale. Because up north, they build these, like you say, they build these big, long, almost, I, I mean, I don't like the word, but causeways where, where they would drive the sheep and they had uh, brush structures that helped them. We don't have any evidence of that. It really looks like they were making them run up the hills from the, from the uh, river. And that was, so they didn't have any guidelines. Or, they used natural features. So they would use, if, and, and you, they would use the arroyo cuts. I wonder if I can go back just a little bit and show you. So they would, they would use some of these, uh, there are cuts that, that come up from the river. And so it looks like they would use those natural features. But we don't have any evidence of the kinds of modifications we see up north. Okay, so a, a related question also from Kara. In Great Basin pronghorn drives, there is ethnographic evidence that shamans help to guide animals into targeted areas. Do you think that would be possible? You know, we don't have, and somebody had asked about the, Eric had asked about the rock art. We don't have the rock art data that we have. In other areas where you get this kind of, of uh, real focus on bighorn sheep, you get a lot of rock art. And, and we don't have that. And so that's really an interesting question. Is it because they're not using the same kind of uh, shamanistic uh, help? Or is it just because there's not a lot of areas out here, which is my, my theory, not a lot of out areas out here to put rock art on? <laughs> so, which is, tends to be my theory more, is that if there was more rock that you could actually put a lot of rock art on, you would see more of it. But uh, we just have very, very little rock art in this area. Um, Erica may have joined us a little later. Um, she asks, were there signs of habitation at the cave level? Like, um, No, not, not level in level. the cave. That's a good question. No, the cave was just, that rock, the rock shelter was used very specialized all the way through. But the, the, the habitation, the campsites were on, on the dunes over near it, but not there at that site. I don't have any other questions right now. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to go ahead and type in that question and answer section. All right, Erica, you did answer her question. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming and listening. And uh, I hope everybody has a good evening then. And continue to support Nevadans for Cultural Preservation. They're awesome. Yeah, we got a new member today. So that's Great. awesome. That's and um, just keep a lookout, uh, whether you heard about this through email or on social media. Um, we'll announce Kara's talk and, again, additional speakers 
as they come. Um, and if there's anything you want to see us present on, or if you have any um, ideas for projects, just reach out to us. We're more than happy to work with anybody interested and um, check out that YouTube channel so you can see more. <laughs>